in this part two video of chapter eight, let's continue talking about a corporate reorganizations. Remember that this is under code section 368 and then subsection A, paragraph one, and all these letters are subparagraphs identifying the different types of reorgs. So the common one that we've seen or mentioned already is a type A reorg. A meaning, let's say, assets. You're trying to acquire the assets of the target corporation in exchange for stock of the acquiring corporation. And the main thing here is you're trying to comply with state law, not necessarily just the Internal Revenue Code. Um, we'll see some other principles uh, at the near the end of this slideshow regarding uh, trying to meet that Internal Revenue Code um, rules or principles. But again, the main thing here, statutory state law mergers or, or consolidations you're trying to follow. So typically, let's, let's take a look at an illustration here. So typically, here is the acquiring corporation using its stock and probably some money forming a new corporation. So this could be something like a uh, Section 351 creating a new corporation. But what you're doing right away is using that stock and maybe money to buy the shares of the holder of the target corporation. So here is the stock of the target corporation now held by the new subsidiary. And we're going to merge the target into the new subsidiary. So all the assets here, all the liabilities being assumed now go over to the new subsidiary. So target goes out of existence and shareholder T is now a new shareholder of the acquiring corporation. A continuity of uh, continuity of interest here and we're running the old business now in this new subsidiary owned by the acquiring corporation. So this is a tax-free uh, uh, transaction for the target corporation. They don't recognize any gain or loss, basically because all the cost basis, all cost basis goes over to the new acquiring sub. Now, for the shareholder T, T shareholders, it could be taxable if they receive, remember, boot. Otherwise, the stock basis of the old T stock will transfer I should say uh, substitute to the stock basis for the uh, acquiring corporation here. So let's say that the target has to stay in business because maybe it has contracts that it cannot assign to anybody else. So we call that a reverse acquisition or reverse merger. So same stock and cash going to the sub, same exchange of A stock for T stock, but this time the merger will transfer the assets liabilities to the target. So this goes out of existence with the T stock now being owned by the acquiring corporation. So parent owning the sub. So T stays in existence. Whatever contracts T has is still there. Um, it's so transparent they don't even know now there's a new owner for T corporation. Let's talk about a B type. Uh, where we're using the stock of the acquiring corporation to buy the stock of the um, target corporation. So what you're doing is de dealing directly with the target corporation shareholders. So here is the shareholder of the target corporation. And all we're doing is exchanging shares eventually this uh, S shareholder will now be a shareholder of A. So now we have a sub here. The thing is, it almost looks like the same result we saw in a type A. But if you look at this uh, diagram, you see the word solely? You cannot use cash, it has to be only stock. So if I were the shareholder here thinking of retiring, I think I still want to get some money out of all of this and not be subject to the um, whims or the, the success of the A corporation here. 
which I really probably don't have a control over, even though I own shares in it, yeah? So maybe you still want to go back to that uh, type A reorg versus this type B. Type C, we're still trying to acquire the assets of the target corporation using the stock of the acquiring corporation. But now you're not following the rules of the state's merger and consolidation laws, but you're following just the rules of the Internal Revenue Code. And probably again, you only can use the stock of the, um, of the acquiring corporation. Type D, think D is division or divisive, what you're trying to typically do is split up or spin off operations or subsidiaries from a parent corporation. Um, so uh, examples I've seen is you have one corporation where you have let's say two different operations or you have two different shareholders and they can't get along so what you can do is form a subsidiary here for one and two and transfer the assets and then you transfer the stock of the parent corporation uh, uh, in exchange for the subs here so now each person would own their own corporation and this is now no longer in existence so there's variations of this for existing subsidiaries versus trying to create a new one uh, a lot of different variations under type D and our textbook doesn't go into really any of them. So here's some rules or principles under uh, tax law that you have to meet to make the reorganizations uh, generally tax-free. When we're talking about continuity of interest, we're talking about the shareholders of the target corporations continuing their interest in this reorganization by acquiring stock of the acquiring corporation. Continuity of business means the target corporation's business is continuing either as a subsidiary of the acquiring corporation or um, working within like um, the division of the parent corporation or the uh, acquiring corporation. This last one here, business purpose test, says that all of this reorg, at least the primary purpose, cannot be for the avoidance of paying taxes. Really, doing things for reducing taxes is not considered to be a business purpose. There must be something else. Most times it's to separate or control um, liability or risk by putting different operations in different corporations. Now let's talk about liquidating. Here the term is called complete or full liquidation versus partial liquidation with, that we had learned back in chapter seven. So we're gonna go out of business. So when you do know that's gonna happen, this form 966 has to be filed within 30 days of um, determining that the corporation is gonna go in, out of existence or liquidate. This is in addition to filing the last form 1120 for the corporation. Now, what's the effect on the shareholders? It depends on the type of shareholder, type meaning either another corporation, like a parent corporation, or individual, like you or I, or, or non-corporate, like a partnership probably owning stock in this uh, liquidating corporation. And also if you're a corporate owner, what's your percentage ownership in the subsidiary? In the case of non-corporate owner shareholders of the liquidating corporation, you're gonna treat this as a taxable sale or exchange, meaning that whatever fair market value proceeds you get out of the corporation, you're going to minus out the cost basis of the stock you have, the adjusted basis, to either get a gain, probably long-term capital gain, or loss. If you're a, well, let's move on to the next screen. 
Here they talk again about non-corporate shareholders. You're going to report a probably a capital gain. That's the fair market value of the money that you get or property you get minusing out the stock basis of the shares being uh, redeemed in this liquidation. Here it says that if the um, shareholders assume liabilities of the corporation, you just reduce the fair market value of property received. Now if the shareholder is a corporate shareholder, like a parent corporation, and well let's say and you own less than 80 percent then you go back to this previous screen and you treat that shareholder like a non-corporate shareholder where you report gain or loss but if the corporate shareholder owns 80 percent or more of the liquidating corporation this transaction is going to be tax free to the uh, corporate shareholder and also tax-free to the liquidating corporation. Now, how do you treat the liquidation to the liquidating corporation if you have uh, liquidating proceeds going to the non-corporate shareholder? The taxable liquidating distribution. The liquidating corporation is going to recognize gain or loss on the distribution of property to and this should be non-corporate shareholders okay versus corporate shareholders or corporate shareholders that have less than 80 percent interest okay so not only is there going to be a tax at the shareholder level there's also going to be tax or recognition at the corporate level upon liquidation but if now the corporate shareholder is 80% or more ownership, the liquidating corporation has no gain or loss, just like the corporate shareholder. But again, it has to be a corporate shareholder and 80% or more interest. So here this mentioned you have to file the final annual uh, corporate tax return. And you can deduct any liquidating expenses being incurred. Also, if you have unamortized organizational costs then all of that can be probably written off in this last year now if you if you cannot use any of these costs including net operating losses or unused capital loss carry forwards or charitable contribution carry forwards all of it just disappears with this uh, liquidating corporation there's no benefit here or the benefit is lost Okay, let's stop here. Go ahead and work on your Learn Smart uh, practice questions, your homework assignment. Make sure you're ready before taking your one attempt for the chapter quiz. Also, we're going to have a, another exam coming up here after we finish chapter 8. And I'll be assigning also our first project of two projects for the semester.